I'm Andrew Sherman. I'm a Texas transplant who has always been in pursuit of art as a career. I've played in bands, pursued an acting career in Hollywood, but I found it behind the lens of a camera here in Dallas, Texas. I was born in New York, I've lived in Chicago, Los Angeles, Austin, but I love Dallas. There's a magical artistic scene in Dallas that mostly goes unnoticed to the outside world. This podcast is focused on what makes it so special and the people who make it thrive artistically. If you don't live here, and even if you do, you might not have heard of them. This is the Dallas Famous Podcast. Jeffrey Lyles is a true part of Dallas music history. In this episode, Jeff takes us on a trip of sorts from the early alternative rock days of Deep Ellum to his L.A. days and the unlikely birth of his band Cottonmouth, Texas, all the way to the present with his work at the Kessler Theater, and even into the future with the Longhorn Ballroom. The stories are epic, and the pieces Jeff puts into place about the history of Dallas music will hopefully be just the start of an ongoing conversation. Enjoy this chat with Jeffrey Lyles. Okay, today we've got Jeffrey Lyles with us. Now, tell me your job description here at the Kessler. I am the artistic director at the Kessler Theater in Oak Cliff. Awesome. awesome. That involves a lot of different stuff. That involves talent buying, putting on special events, uh, curating the artwork in the art gallery space, uh, basically the vibe guy. Mm -hmm. But you're that, nothing to do with the bands coming in? Yeah. Oh, you, all of that? Not all of it. I okay. just booked some of it. We have a, our lead talent buyer is a guy down in uh, Houston named Mark Austin. Right. Oh, that's right. There's another Kessler in Houston. Uh, it's not called the Kessler. The it's called the Heights Theater. Right. Okay. And basically, Mark books everything that's a touring act that's going to play in both places. Okay. Uh, some of our more established acts, uh, the acts that are, uh, you know, basically sell this place out every time. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that I book is more kind of niche stuff. Okay. Uh, kind of sometimes one offs like our homage nation nights where we have like 20 different musicians come in and pay tribute to an artist like Pink Floyd or Alice Cooper or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I book the stuff, uh, that is kind of local or regional, like Tripping Daisy, mm -hmm. the Buck Pets, MC 900 Foot Jesus, Ten Hands, that kind of stuff. Right. I, you know, it's funny. I, I used to love that band. I remember seeing them and I, I didn't realize from Dallas when I first came here. And it, yeah. I mean, Which band is that? MC 900 Foot Jesus. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, guy band. I mean, whatever. But um, yeah, that's Mark. Cool. Mark, uh, who is MC 900 Foot Jesus, has been a part of the Dallas music scene for probably going on 40 years now. Yeah. Oh, wow. He was in a band called uh, White Man and he worked at a record store on Cedar Springs called VVV Records. Uh, a lot of the DJs in town would go to VVV and get uh, all the industrial hip hop stuff when it first came out in the 80s, the mid 80s. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, he was the guy that turned everybody on to Tackhead and Fats Comet and all the Adrian Sherwood stuff. And uh, he was also the guitar player in Lithium Christmas. I didn't even know he played guitar. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, he's a great musician. He plays trumpet. Uh, he's, you know, I think he actually studied music in college. I think that, okay. that's his thing. MC 900 for Jesus was kind of something that he did uh, basically when samplers first came out. Right. I was just messing around. He was kinda. one of the first people in town that had a sampler. And he was the guy who... Uh, you know, one of the one of the handful of people that actually was into the very beginning of digital technology and using sampling gear. Oh, OK. I mean, it, I, I remember loving it and it was sort of like just so much different. It wasn't rap, but he was rapping, but it was just more like poetry and a story. And storytelling. Yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, I don't even know. I, I'm, I, OK, I shouldn't say I'm not like super versed in hip. I'm like, who else is even doing it like that now? I mean, not, not a lot of people. Right. Um, You know. No, not really. I mean, yeah. his stuff also had a lot of jazz inclinations. It mm -hmm. had lots of incredible musicians playing on it. Right. Um, I made a couple records back around that same time under the name Cottonmouth, Texas, that were similar. But rather than have a jazz kind of take on it, mine was more of a straight hip hop style backing music. Oh, okay. Wait, let's, yeah, let's get back to your story a little bit. You're, you're from Dallas, is that right? Yeah, I was born at Baylor Hospital. Uh, okay, they're true Dallas. Okay. But, I mean, you got a long life of a lot of stories, I'm sure. But like, what, what drew you to music initially? Uh, my dad taking me to concerts when I was a young person. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was probably 12 years old when he took me to my first show to see Elton John and Steely Dan at the Cotton Bowl. Oh, wow. Uh, that was pretty amazing. My dad was always playing music in the car, you know, back when, when eight track tapes were still a thing. Uh -huh. He was really into the band, uh, and mm -hmm. Robbie Robertson, yeah. the band and Steely Dan and stuff like that. He had really, really good taste in music. And, uh, he kept 
just, you know, constantly turning me on to stuff. His father, my grandfather, gave me my first record, which was a Beatles record, Sgt. Pepper's. Mm, wow. And, of course, like a lot of young people, the Beatles totally blew my mind. And uh, I remember I was this. I mean, I was really young then. I was probably five or six years old. But after hearing Sgt. Pepper's, I made my parents really go out and buy every Beatles record that was available at the time. <laughs> you know, and I literally had their whole anthology of music before I ever really realized that other people made music. Oh, wow. You know, I thought like literally the Beatles were the only band on the earth, you know, because they had so many different styles and so many different textures and approaches. And, and every song was different from the other. They didn't have like any one singular sound except for on that very first record. And so that whole expanse and breadth of scope of what they did to me could have been 10 bands. Huh. You know, it could have been yeah. 10 bands worth of music to absorb and take into. And I remember the first uh, artist that I heard that wasn't the Beatles was Sly Stone. When I heard Sly Stone's If You Want Me to Stay on the radio, I was like, whoa, what's that? I mean, how different than That's the Beatles. John Paul, George, or Ringo, you know? And yeah. then I immediately had to go get that album fresh, you know? And that turned me on to soul music. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Well, okay. So then you love music. Now, at what point did you go, I've got to be a part of it? Were you playing as a young person? Oh, yeah. I was in a garage band. Mm -hmm. I, you know, every, every kid in our neighborhood wanted to be in a garage band. And I had a band called Wizard. And we did Pinball Wizard by the Who, you know. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember our big gig, our first big gig, when well, I was still, you know, in 10th grade or something. This kid had a keg party at his house. A guy named Scott McGregor had a keg party at his house in Richardson. And our band played at it. We're set up in his living room, you know. And there's about 600 people showed up. It was just a mob scene. Oh, no. And uh, the police came and arrested a bunch of people. And and it was uh, it was great, man. As far as the first gig goes, it was perfect. That's you the know? first gig. Wow. Yeah. I, although it's a little let. I mean, like, when's the next time you're playing for 600 people, right? Uh, the next time I played in front of a lot of people was at Fred's Park Recreation Center. Okay. We did a gig there on a Friday night. You know, it was all kids, of course. It wasn't like a bar or anything. Sure. But, uh, you know, same deal. Huh. You know, back then, if you had owned a guitar, you were in a garage band and you, you know, so I graduated from high school in 1980. So that was, that was about when I was a sophomore in high school, something okay. like that. And so, okay. So you're playing in bands. Is there a point where you're like, I want to be a musician my whole life? Or at some point did you go, you know, this is cool, but there's other stuff to this. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a clear drop off between being in a garage band and being in a band that actually does shows. Yeah. And, uh, back then there weren't a whole lot of bass players in Dallas. I knew how to play guitar and I'd drawn the conclusion that the four strings on the bass were the same as the top four strings on mm -hmm. a guitar. Right. So I figured, uh, well, I saw, I saw, first of all, I saw a thing in the back of Buddy magazine that said this band was looking for a bass player. And uh, they were called Group Six. They were a punk rock band in Dallas, one of the early punk rock bands called The Do, but they had just changed their name to the Group Six. And I was standing in Bill's Records out in North Dallas one day saying, wow, this band needs a bass player. I should borrow a bass and try out. <laughs> and Bill said, if you want to try out, I'll buy you a bass. Whoa. And he bought me a Fender Precision, Maple Fender Precision bass. So I tried out for the band. And because there weren't many bass players in town, I got the gig. All the guys in the band were about 15 years older than I was. I was still pretty much a teenager. And they also had jobs and families and all that stuff. So they couldn't really go out there and hustle us gigs. And so I told them, I'll get us a gig somewhere, you know. Right. And uh, got us a gig at this place called Nairobi Room, which was uh, an old hot sheet motel on Harry Hines Boulevard that had this lounge. <laughs> and they would let bands play in there. Right. And so we did that gig and it was great. And so uh, I went down to Deep Ellum, and this was before people were really recognizing Deep Ellum as Deep Ellum as a neighborhood. It was an empty warehouse district mm -hmm. that had uh, art galleries here and there. And this one art gallery down there was having bands play at their art openings. And uh, it was a guy named Russell Hobbs. He was doing theater gallery. And I walked in there one day and said, hey, I'm in a band, man. Can we play at one of your art openings or whatever? And he didn't even listen to our demo tape. He was like, sure, no problem. Huh. So he gave me a gig for two weeks later. And uh, I went back to tell the guys in the band, hey, I got us a gig at this art gallery. It's going to be great. And I goes, well, we got some bad news. We're going to break up the band. Uh -huh. So I had to go back to Russell, you know, and tell him, man, my band broke up, you know. And he was like, uh, well, why don't you stay here and help me book some bands? And I said, sure, I'll do that. I'll be happy to do that. Oh, okay. I'd never done that kind of thing before, obviously. But... Um, that was before the internet too. If you were going right. to book bands, you had to go to a band show and get their phone number, meet them, and yeah. go through the whole process of building a personal relationship with them and all that. And it was very time consuming and very, uh, 
you know, it was it was <laughs> kind of a beating, but it was something I, you know, I fell right into. Right. I mean, were you kind of at, was there some party that's like, well, I'd like to be playing instead, or did you just like this just took you over? Um, yeah, you know what? It, it was kind of more interesting to be part of a, a kind of emerging culture because mm -hmm. there were a lot of people that lived in the theater gallery space. It was like a big kind of artist commune oh, cool. type thing, and uh, I ended up moving in, <laughs> and I had my bed right on the stage. I slept on the stage. And um, there was an interesting, you know, group of people that came together to make that place happen. Yeah. One of them was Reverend Horton Heath. He was the house sound man. Then, oh, cool. Back when he was just Jim Heath. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, wow. I want to get back, though. How did you meet Bill? So tell us about Bill a little Bill's bit. Bill's record store was right by our house. Okay. You know, I would go there and hang out almost every day. Okay. You know, it was so close. It was a Spring Valley and Coit at the time. And, uh, you know, I'd ride my bike up there and go hang out and just check out records and, you know, meet all the customers and stuff. It was an awesome place to be. Okay, cool. I mean, I didn't, I was not able to meet Bill. I didn't, I was, I moved here a little later and I didn't really get some, that's kind of why I wanted to have you on today is like to hear some of these stories, some of these people that like everyone else might have known that's been here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bill was an amazing person. He was an avatar. He was an icon. Uh, he, you know, the center of the, uh, the he, I mean, for a while, long time, the store was the center of gravity for the Dallas music scene. Wow. And if you were like in a, a baby band and you were just making your first record or whatever, that was usually the first place you took it. When you got it back from the pressing plant, you mm -hmm. would take it to Bill and get it on sale. So you had a record and then a store available for the public. That's you know? cool. Okay. So now you're booking bands and... At what point does it kind of take you like even further than this space and you start doing bigger kind of booking type stuff? Well, it happened pretty quick. I mean, I, uh, I was at Theater Gallery booking the bands there. Uh, Theater Gallery was the first place in Dallas that the Flaming Lips, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Jane's Addiction, Husker Du. A lot of these bands, it was the first play. I, I, I'm sorry, I take that back. Husker Du had played a couple of times at a smaller punk clubs. But like the Jane's Addiction and the Chili Peppers and Bad Marines, a lot of these bands, the theater gallery was where, you know, they got their first big following in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So to be part of that, it was still an underground thing. We didn't have any licenses. We didn't have a liquor license. The place was completely illegal. Huh. Um, you know, and we let underage people in. We had free beer every night. Uh, to be a part of that and be totally immersed in that culture um, was, you know, it was all consuming. You mm -hmm. know, it was pretty much it took up all my bandwidth. I, I didn't really have time to, you know, say, hey, I got to be in a band, too, and rehearse and do all that stuff. It was kind of more fun to be like in everybody's band. Right, right. Basically, yeah. and there were all these bands that were, uh, you know, the funny thing about this is a lot of people don't know this about Deep Allen, but when Theater Gallery first happened, it wasn't people who lived in Deep Allen. It was all kids from the suburbs. Uh -huh. All of these bands that were emerging in the neighborhood, like Shallow Rain and uh, Three on a Hill and all these bands that were coming out, they all came from these different suburbs. Three on a Hill came from Carrollton. Shallow Rain came from North Dallas. And Richardson, basically, uh, Buck Pets came from Plano, Andover Inn came from Highland Park, uh, the New Bohemians came from East Dallas. You know, a lot of them had band members that were students at Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. So anyway, these kids all came from the outskirts of town. They came from kind of like the suburb, suburban areas to this warehouse district where they had this culture building uh, that was all kind of... Uh, blossoming out of nowhere. Hmm. And for a lot of these kids, rather than hang out in their suburbs, they wanted to come to this place where they had their own thing going. Yeah. And it was under the radar. Their parents didn't know where they were going or what they were doing. Hmm. It was their kind of hidden mystery, their their place where it was, you know, completely under the radar. It you sounds know? amazing, yeah. Yeah, and it was amazing. Yeah. It was totally different than it is now. I mean, literally, Theater Gallery was the only building down there that had a piece of neon on the front of it. Huh. And it was a very small TG. That's it. The rest of the neighborhood was dark. Wow. The wow. next club that came out after that pretty much was Club Dada. Oh, okay. So they're And that opened in 86. Okay. Two years later. So then when did the theater close down? Um, well, I left theater gallery before it closed down. Okay. I went to work at Dada when it first opened. I was the first booking agent there. Oh, cool. And then 1990, same deal with trees. Um, back when I used to work at theater gallery, I would walk over to Elm street and Elm street was completely dead. It was totally desolate. And, um, there was clear view, which was kind of a dance club. And again, it was same kind of deal. There It was an underground thing. Mm -hmm. 
they had live music there, but live music wasn't the main focus. It was right. more of a dance culture type place. Sure. Um, but I would walk over to Elm Street and I would see the building at 2713. It was an empty building, but you could see from the inside of it that it looked like an old ballroom or something. The way that they had these big pane glass uh, windows in the front where you could just look in there. And the, um, the, the guy who owned the property would leave one light on, one light bulb on, so you could kind of see this place. Hmm. And it had an ascending staircase up the front in the middle. And you could just tell back in the 20s or 30s or whatever that it was an old ballroom, and that was trees. Mm, wow. And I remember when uh, Brian Davis rented that place out, he had hired this woman named Jessica Clark to be the publicist for it. And he was going to make a restaurant there. He's going to put a restaurant in there. And she talked him into doing a live music venue. Huh. And I met with them and, you know, they gave me the gig to be the booking agent there or whatever. We changed Brian's mind on the spot. He was only like 22 or 23 years old at the time uh-huh. uh, and changed his mind and got him to do a live music venue. And that's what became Trees. That's, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So like, who were some of the first big bands that you were getting into, like Dada and Trees? Well, Trees happened at the perfect time. Uh, it came around right when alternative music as a whole was taking a giant leap forward. Mm-hmm. Um, when the bands like Red Hot Chili Peppers and Jane's Addictions played at Theory Gallery, they were playing for maybe a hundred people, mm-hmm. 150 people, something like that. It wasn't really huge. We did a couple of shows there that ended up being really huge. The Butthole Surfers probably drew about four or 500 people. Oh, wow, yeah. And, um, Bad Brains probably drew about 400 people, but still it was a much smaller deal. Now, when Trees happened in 1990, the whole alternative music culture was just taking a giant leap forward. Mm-hmm. So we were able to get acts like Nirvana. We had Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam played for like 35 people at Trees <laughs> before anybody knew who they were. Right. Uh, Radiohead played there. Wow. Uh, we had all of these bands that just, you know, Flaming Lips, they, they all just got bigger. You know, they'd mm-hmm. all taken a, a, a necessary leap forward to play in front of bigger audiences. So Trees holding 750 people was the logical next step for them. Mm-hmm. And it, it really kind of was the logical next step for the whole neighborhood. You know, because once it started, all this other stuff started popping up on Elm Street. Dada started blowing up. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people don't know this about Club Dada, but Club Dada didn't start out strictly as a live music venue. Club Dada started because there was a performance art group here in town called Victor Dada. And uh, back during that time period, early 80s or whatever, there was a place down in Austin called Esther's Follies. Uh And it was on 6th Street. It's still there. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they have these like performance art things, these skits and oh. all this stuff. And that's what Victor Dada did. Okay. And they, they did the same kind of deal, interactive audience, immersive type things where, uh, you know, it's kind of more, uh, almost comedy. You know, it was broad performance art, you know. Okay. And they had seen Esther's Follies, I'm sure. And they'd wanted to do, replicate something like that in Dallas. And that's what Vic, uh, Club Dada started out being. It was the, the logical extension of Victor Dada, the performance art group. Huh. And they brought me on to book shows there like every now and then to fill in the extra spaces where they weren't doing Victor Dada. Huh. Wow. And that didn't that didn't really last that long. The music thing took off so big that that's what they really started doing full time. Right. Right. There were two or three bands in town that were really just starting to blow up. The New Bohemians. Every mm-hmm. time they play, there'd be four or five hundred people there. Right. And they play in the backyard at Dada. And that's kind of, you know, 10 hands, same deal. Uh-huh. Uh, kind of lifted Fever in the Funk House. You know, all, all these bands had their own little following of like four or five hundred people. They'd gotten their start playing at Theater Gallery and Profit Bar, the original Profit Bar, which mm-hmm. is right across the street from the Theater Gallery, where mm-hmm. Uncle Ubers is now. Okay. Um, that's another thing about the guy. When, when, when Russell started Profit Bar, he and I were living upstairs in that second floor space above what is now Uncle Uber sandwich spot. Mm-hmm. And there were some great shows at Profit Bar back then, too, yeah. like True Believers and Screaming Jay Hawkins, people like that. They all played there. And then it moved, right? The Profit Bar like, moved locations. He, yeah, he actually did another venue after that called The Door. Uh-huh. And after The Door happened for a few years, then he got the old Gypsy Tea Room space and re- resurrected the Profit Bar in that space. Right, right. And now that's gone, too. Yeah. It changes so much down there. Yeah. And if you were to ask me uh, what venue probably had the best curated overall playlist at the time it was in existence, I would say Gypsy Tea Room. Right. I've heard a lot about that. I didn't work at Gypsy Tea Room, but I totally recognized that their booking was everything from Slayer to Willie Nelson to 
Beck, wow. you know, everybody played wow. there. I mean, just looking at the list of the artists that play there on paper, it's amazing. It's incredible. Uh, that was about, that opened probably about seven or eight years after Trees opened. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm guessing right, right in there, uh, late 90s. Now, did you, did, uh, I know you ended up in L.A. Um, is there something in between in Dallas before you, like, how did you get to L.A.? Well, uh, that's kind of weird. After I left Trees, I didn't know what I was going to do next. I didn't really have any idea, but I figured I'd go out to L.A. for a while and just kind of kick around out there. I had friends that lived there and offered me a place to stay. Right. And uh, I was out there hanging out on the beach one day in Venice. And the woman who had signed the New Bohemians, this lady named Teresa Ensonat, uh, she was formerly a talent scout at Geffen at the time. I ran into her on the beach in Venice. Hmm. She had since moved from Geffen Records to A&M Records. And she said, what are you doing out here, Jeff? And I said, I don't know. And she's like, well, you know, do you want me to book you some time to do a demo or something at the A&M Studios? And... Honestly, I didn't have anything else going in my life. So I was like, sure. I didn't have any equipment. I didn't have any songs. I didn't have a band name. I didn't have anything. Huh. But I figured if I could just go in the studio, I could maybe come up with something off the top of my head. Prior to that, I had had a band called Deccan and Dub Team that had landed a song on the Color soundtrack, the Dr. Dre remix. Oh, wow. And uh, that's kind of what she was thinking is that I would put together something similar to what we had done with Deccan and Dub Team. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I called a friend of mine up. Who lived out there. He was a DJ. His name is Mickey Petralia. And Mickey has like since gone on to become a big record producer. He's done Beck's records and Flight of the Concourse records, all these other really cool stuff. But at the time, he was one of the few people I knew in Los Angeles that had sampling gear, I had somebody that I could communicate with on that level to create something from scratch. So I called Mickey. I said, hey, man, I'm booked in A&M Studios for the next week. And I don't have any songs. I don't have any gear. I don't know what I'm going to do. Can you come and help me? Yeah. And he's like, well, when do you start? And I said, tomorrow morning. He said, well, I can't make it tomorrow, but I can maybe make it the next day. I still had to go in there and do something. Right. So I showed up that day and I was honest with the engineer. I was, I, I, was, I don't have anything here. I mean, I really don't know what I'm going to do. The guy that I'm working with can't be here until tomorrow. And I said, listen, I've got these notebooks here where I've been writing these little short story vignette things for, for months now. Would you mind if I read these onto tape? Just in case I ever lose these notebooks. And the guy's like, dude, it's your time. Do whatever you want. Hmm. So I went in the booth and I sat there and read these little short stories one after another. There were 20 of them. Huh. And they're each of them will last like, like two minutes long, something like that. And that's what I did that whole first day. I didn't rehearse them. I didn't like perform them. I was just kind of documenting them on tape in case I ever lost the notebooks. So the next day, Mickey shows up and we sit there and come up with all these beats and all this stuff, all this stuff we make up from scratch. It was going to be all instrumental music. And at the end of the day, the engineer pressed the unmute button on the channel that had my vocals from the day before that was striped onto the tape at the same place where the music was. He's like, whoa, that's weird. And Mickey looks at me and goes like, what is that? I was like, oh, that's just some shit I did yesterday. He goes, no, man, that works. You know, <laughs> that were, they really work together. And I mean, they're completely oblivious. The two components were oblivious to each other. You know, they're, the music didn't know what the vocals were doing. The vocals didn't know what the music was doing. Right. They were just, they were both done on their own separately, but happened to be striped on the same piece of tape. Huh. So anyway, it turns out after listening to all of them, we had 17 of them that worked. <laughs> Jeez. After two days. Crazy. Right. And she and Teresa was kind of expecting me to go in there and to come up with like four songs that it would be demo ideas. Mm -hmm. And these sound like finished product. So she was like, took it back to the people there and said, hey, we got to develop this artist, you know, or whatever. They made me some cassettes. I passed out some cassettes to friends and stuff out in L.A. And word started to get out about it that, you know, hey, this is really different. And so all these other labels wanted to meet with me and talk about signing. Wow. I mean, obviously, I was obligated to Teresa uh -huh. at A&M because she had put me in the studio and she had also signed the New Bohemian. So she had a connection to Dallas music. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I owed it to her to, uh, you know, exhaust that opportunity at A&M or not, whatever was going to happen. Sure. And eventually they decided not to sign me and I ended up getting signed to Virgin. Hmm. Wow. OK, yeah. that's cool. But it was a record made purely on accident. Wow. I mean, it was a complete, total accident. If I had never run into her that day, there would be no Cottonmouth, Texas. Huh. 
That's crazy. Yeah, it was a complete accident. And in a way, I mean, that's kind of a gift to have that kind of experience because so many musicians, when they're making their record, they're making their project or doing their thing, they overthink it beforehand. Mm -hmm. You know, they think, oh, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that and I'm going to put this together with that, you know, and, and it almost kills, it almost makes the making of the record kind of anticlimactic. Mm -hmm. And this was a record that was made uh, piecemeal without either component being aware of what the other component was doing. Mm -hmm. And because it was spoken word and wasn't verses and choruses and and lines that rhymed or whatever, it was just me talking, telling a story. It was almost like listening to a film score, hmm. wow. listening to a movie or something right. told in right. first person. And uh, that's what ended up becoming my first record. Before I signed with Virgin, I took that tape back to Dallas and there was a local label here called One Ton Records. And one time put it out under the name White Trash Receptacle. <laughs> and then Virgin re-released it under a different name. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So now you're you're a signed musician in LA all of a sudden. And it was very different to, yeah. be, to, to be couch surfing and also to be going to eat at the Palm at night <laughs> with record executives. You right. Know, sure. Shaking me out with an expense account or whatever. It was complete two different worlds that were polar opposites of each other. Right. But I wasn't going to like walk away from it mm -hmm. because, I mean, you know, if that the this record, quote unquote record, the, the demo that I did that was completely made by accident, maybe I'm on like on a streak of good luck, you know. Sure. And um I, I was out there after I did the deal with Virgin. Uh, Virgin had entered into this agreement with this video production company out there called Underground Media, mm -hmm. who made music videos. And they had engaged them to do a film version of the record. Mm. So that was all going to take time. I knew that was going to, you know, it was going to take time to develop and get the right people involved and all that stuff. So I had to buy some time. You know, I had to do something in the meantime. So I started working at this production company just kind of as a gopher, you know, as a mm. runner and doing simple shit. And um, this this company ended up doing the tool videos for Prison Sex and Sober. They did Marilyn Manson's Sweet Dreams video. They did Dave Matthews' Crash video. They did Ozzy Osbourne's I Just Want You. Mm -hmm. They did uh, David Bowie and Trent Reznor's I'm Af uh, Afraid of Americans. They were they were on a roll, man. Right. Everything that they were they were doing was getting on MTV. MTV still mattered back then. Right. And. Um, you know, they, they, to me, more than anybody, they single handedly made Dave Matthews career. Mm -hmm. You know, they did the crash video, which got him on MTV. They did the don't drink the water video, which, you know, was his next big step. And, um, yeah, working there really kind of, uh, gave me more of a, uh, sensibility about the artistic, the vi uh, creative visual component of making records, you know, mm -hmm. how important that was. Right. Right. That's crazy that that resume. That Metallica. Uh, wow. Yeah, the Memory Remains video. I, I worked on that one. The the concept of that video is the band is inside of this music box, and Marianne Faithful is turning it, cranking it with her hand, huh. and they're spinning around in a circle like that. So I was on the outside of it, pulling these ropes, pulling that room <laughs> around in a circle with four other guys. Oh, you know? uh, cool. I did a lot of production work and extra work, and it's always fun. Like to like, oh my god, that I, yeah. You see, in Flying of the Apes, that hand, that's me. That's my hand. <laughs> you know, like stuff like that's fun. Okay, so now you're working here, and you're waiting for like this thing to happen with your music, your project. Like, what? How does what happens next? Uh, I ended up going on the Lollapalooza tour. Okay. In 1997. As what? Cottonmouth, Texas. Oh, touring. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we also. Uh, I did that by myself, uh, but we did a full band tour, too, where we played up and down the West Coast and played the Viper Room and a bunch of clubs in Seattle and San Francisco and places like that. Uh, we played on Infest with Radiohead and Foo Fighters mm -hmm. in 97. There was a station up there, uh, uh, KNDD, that was just playing the Cottonmouth record every day. I mean, a commercial station. It was the only one in the country that was playing it. And Marco Collins, uh, the program director up there at the time, loved the record. And that's how we ended up getting on Infest. And, and I mean, we, we sold more records in Seattle than we did in the rest of the country combined. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So yeah, it's, that sounds like a successful endeavor. I, I mean, again, like I've heard of Cottonmouth, but I guess I just didn't understand the whole depth of, uh, of the success that you had. Yeah. It wasn't a traditional band. I mean, it was, it was, uh, I mean, we had great band members, Kenny Withrow, the new Bohemians guitar player was a guitarist mm -hmm. and. Dave Monsey, who was the bass player for Fiona Apple, was the bassist. Mike Jerome was the drummer who was in Course of Empire and mm. uh, Better Than Ezra. And then, um, 
Yeah, I mean, keyboardist is Zach Baird from Corn. Uh, I mean, we had all these amazing wow. players. So it was, every show was completely different. The only thing that was the same was the story. Right. And the band would rescore each story differently in every city. That is so cool. It's it was like, different. There was no other band out there like it. Yeah, I mean, is there one now even? Probably no, not. No. Yeah. A lot of those guys did play with MC 900 for Jesus, though. Okay, yeah. At some point in time, Earl Harbin, who played with him for years who plays with sam smith now mm -hmm. uh he played on my record and he played on most of mark's records most mc 900s records okay he was in billy goat and ten hands mm -hmm. brilliant drummer yeah absolutely air he plays an air and psychedelic furs oh wow yeah he's Jeez. incredible that's quite yeah okay i know you end up working at the at the roxy how does that transition happen i had gotten to the point where i was at the end of my rope in la and i was going to come back to texas and I'd always liked the Roxy. When I was much younger, my dad had taken me there to see, uh, I went with him on a business trip out to LA and he took me to see Bill Bruford's band there. Huh. The old drummer from Yes had a jazz group. And, uh, I went, that was the first time I went to the Roxy. It was probably in the 1979, 1980, something like that. Uh, Bruford had just released one of a kind record. And anyway, I played there two nights. After going back, uh, after going that first night, I went back the second night and saw it the second night and just totally just hung out. You know, I was so kind of like mesmerized by the scene of Sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And it's weird. The, the Roxy's right next door to the Rainbow Bar and Grill. Right. And all the rock and roll guys hang out at the Rainbow. So I was hanging out after the second Bill Bruford show. This limousine pulls up. And these guys, all these paparazzi people run over to the side of the limousine and they take pictures of, and it's these guys dressed in like fake biker gear. And I didn't recognize them. I was like, who is that? You know? And then they ran into the rainbow and all these paparazzi guys taking pictures of them. Right. And I walked over to the guy who's the parking lot attendant at the rainbow who still works there to this day. Huh. And I said, who is that? And he goes, oh, man, it's these idiots, Motley Crue. They're a local band. They, they do this shit every weekend. They, it's a total publicity stunt. They rent the limo. They act like they're a big deal, and their friends all run up with cameras and act like they're paparazzi. Those guys aren't even real paparazzi. <laughs> and I was like, Motley Crue, huh? You know, they didn't have a record out yet. Right. And then uh, I got back to Texas a couple of months later. I was down in Austin, and there's a little record store called Inner Sanctum. And Motley Crue had just released their first little Andy record on Leather Records. Uh -huh. And they had taken the cover of it and nailed it to the wall with a giant nail going through Vince Neil's crotch. <laughs> With this little sign, handwritten sign underneath it that said the next big thing. And I was like, I saw those guys. I saw them jump out of a limousine in front of Roxy. <laughs> That's awesome. That was a terrible album, too. You know, I never yeah. did like them, but I always yeah. thought that was funny. Yeah. But anyway, I'm out, I'm, I'm out many years, many years later. I'm out in LA and I was packed my truck and I was on my way back to Dallas. And I was driving down Sunset Boulevard in the morning and I looked over at the Roxy and the front door was standing wide open. And I thought, man, I'm going to peek my head in there and see if it still looks the same. So I look in there, and Nick Adler, the guy who runs the place, was just uh -huh. sitting in there at a table just doing the books or something like that. Uh -huh. And I walked in and I introduced myself. And I said, yeah, you know, I've worked at different clubs in Dallas or whatever. He didn't ask for a resume. He looked at me and said, why don't you come work here? I was like, doing what? And he goes, man, I need a night manager. I was like. Well, I've literally got my car packed with my stuff. I'm driving back to Dallas, right? And I goes, no, dude, stay here. You got to work here. I was like, all right, you know what? I will. I'm like, this is an opportunity to work at the Roxy. Yeah. You know, it's a famous place. And so I ended up working there for two and a half years. Huh. That's cool. It was amazing. I mean, the Roxy's a little bit smaller than the Kessler here. Uh, so the unique thing about it is there's a lot of artists that are way too big to play there mm -hmm. that all want to play there. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they all want to scale down and do you know, a knockoff show there. Right. So I'd look at the calendar in the office some days and it would just say TBD. And I knew that was somebody, but they couldn't say. Yeah. They didn't want anyone in the office to know who it was because they didn't want the word getting out. And so I'd go to work that day and it ended up being the Sex Pistols or the Black Crows <laughs> right. or somebody like Patty Smith or somebody like wow. that, you know, doing a, a you know, a, an underplay. Yeah. You know, so. There were, uh, you know, there were a lot of amazing nights like that. When the Red Hot Chili Peppers played there, the night that, that uh, they did their thing there, they literally had police all around the perimeter of the property. Oh, wow. You couldn't even walk on the sidewalk in front of the rocks yeah. unless you had an invitation. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, they had security way out in the street. You yeah, know? yeah. It wasn't a deal where you, you'd plead your case at the front door. You weren't getting anywhere near the front door yeah. if you didn't have an invitation, you know. Yeah, I, 
But I, I literally didn't even know they were playing until that afternoon. That's you crazy. Know, until I got there. Yeah, that's ah, that's amazing. That you know, that's why I moved to Dallas is because when I was working on that show, I was telling you about the Chevy Music Showcase. I I was like, whoa, this feels like L.A. all in one neighborhood. Well, yeah. I was like, oh, I'm going. Well, L.A. for the longest time had this kind of pay to play deal. Yeah, there were so many bands out there. there didn't that start at the whiskey? They did at the whiskey, the troubadour. They, yeah. they did it back then. They did it at all the clubs, and right. the Roxy would only do it like once a month. Mm -hmm. But those nights were really unique because it would be like six different bands with six different audiences. Oh yeah, one audience come in, the next one come in, the next one would leave, next one come yep. in, and it would be six different groups of people that was on the bands to go out there and sell their own tickets to their show. Sure. You know, and a lot of times the bands are nothing like each other. You know, it was a total potluck. You know, you didn't know what you were going to get, but. um you know, you feel like you need to be in these venues and it's like, yeah, but if there's nobody there, what does it matter? Ultimately, it is just a resume to get your name on a flyer. Yeah. I mean, that's why they do it. Yeah. You know, they basically in L.A., the, the people that were in the garage bands, they were in the bands that were still not on the radar yet. They knew that the only way they could build a brand uh, was to get out there and do stupid shit like what Motley Crue did, mm -hmm. you know, with the yeah. fake limo and the fake paparazzi and all that. You know, it's all a publicity stunt. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's just to make a name for themselves. Yeah, I mean, it, what's funny? I'm thinking about. It, I'm like, God, I wish I was dumber when I was doing my band because I was too. I was too cool to do. So, like, I'm not paying to play. I mean, I, Giancarlo is that his name? Uh, I can't remember now. That at the whiskey. Um, uh, I never met any of the whiskey folks. Oh, okay. I don't know him. Well, I mean, I remember meeting him. His car broke down, and I was like, I have a band. He's like, Come on in, and we're all up in the office, and he's like, Okay, five hundred dollars, and we were like, uh, <laughs> Never mind. So I never yeah. played the whiskey. <laughs> well, I mean, in a way, I mean, it's completely messed up way to that's absolutely yeah. a terrible way to do it but on the other hand it does teach the band one valuable lesson that if you're ever going to create a profile for your your act or your thing or whatever you are going to have to get out there and hustle mm -hmm. you can't expect it just to happen organically yeah you know especially in a place like los angeles where yeah. eight million people live and everybody's in a band everybody has a guitar and everybody's you, good well, yeah, I mean, and like of course, and there's tons of people from out of town that are yeah. all moving there to be there. So there's yeah. a huge glut of talent that's all there. And, you know, if anything, it teaches all those no name bands or whatever, that if you ever do want to be someone or whatever, you are going to have to go out there and engage the public on your yeah. own. Yeah. And you're going to have to make it happen. Take yourself. It into your own hands. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't, it's not don't expect it just to happen. Because yeah. what happened to me with getting to make a record on Venice B, I mean, by, by running into someone that didn't happen. No, you know, that was a complete anomaly yeah yeah you know, that just that kind of thing just doesn't happen it's funny too because back then there wasn't social media and you really nope. like i remember i'd go to kinko's at 11 o'clock and make my flyer and then we'd mail it and then half of them would come back and i mean one guy's address was jack me off and i was like didn't get it and like i freaking spent a stamp on that guy anyway dude when when deep island was first starting the kinko's was open 24 hours mm -hmm. so when we were making the theater gallery posters we would show up there at two in the morning yeah and we'd have the press off letters one letter at a time with your thumb you know uh, oh yeah there was no like building something on your computer yeah no, no, i remember computer, you know clearly i mean actually i enjoyed it for a while and then i was like well this is just an exercise in futility because oh, whatever i just i never figured out how to get an audience to my shows out there but so much of it is luck you know i mean yeah some of it is is doing it yourself and busting your ass to create an awareness for yourself but on the other hand there's another part of it you can't control at all and that's yeah. the luck aspect yeah. of it yeah it's true like when I, well, i'll tell you another short story it's similar to that uh when deck and a dove team had done this song for the sound of deep Hellum album i was out in california and and the label was thinking about, you know, doing a demo deal with us. And I was at this person's house. I'm not going to say her name because I don't want to get her in trouble. But I asked her if she knew where to get any pot. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I know one guy that we might can go ask. So we went over to this guy's house. Turns out he was a lawyer, an entertainment lawyer. Hmm. And he had some pot in his freezer. And he gave me some pot. He said, here, roll as many joints as you want. So I did. And I was like, oh, this is great. And we're just about to leave. They said, what do you do, man? Why are you out here? And I said, oh, I'm in a band. We're thinking about doing a, a deal here with Island. And he's like, oh, I'd love to hear your music. And I was like, oh, shit, I don't have anything with me. And, and she was like, oh, I got the tape out in the car. Hang on a second. She went and grabbed the tape, brought it back in, played it for him. And the next day he played it for Dennis Hopper, who was directing the movie Colors. Oh, wow. And it got in, I got on the Colors soundtrack. That's amazing. And, and this, she was trying to sign NWA at the same time, who were just starting out. So she got Dr. Dre to remix the song for the movie. Huh. He did it for 500 bucks. Wow. None of that would have happened if I didn't want to bum a joint that night. <laughs>
You think part of that was that you weren't really pushing yourself on this guy? Because that's a thing in L.A. It was way too early to be pushing ourselves yeah. on anybody. All yeah. we had was one song. Right. You know, it, was, it wasn't like, you know, there was nothing we could push. You know, we were on a compilation record with 10 other bands. Sure. We could push the neighborhood. You know, we could tell people about Deep Ellum, you know, and then sure enough, I mean, it, it had a reputation on its own that yeah. lifted up all of those artists that were on that record. Mm -hmm. The Buck Pat signed with Island, New Bohemian signed with Geffen. You know, I mean, we got on the color soundtrack. There, there, there was a way to push the neighborhood, but still, if you were out in Los Angeles trying to describe to people the music scene in Dallas, the only way you would ever really fully grasp what was going on here is if you got on a plane and came here. Sure. And it wasn't long after that, the A&R people from every label started showing up. Right, right. And so what are some of the bands from that era, like Tripping Daisy and... Tripping Daisy was a little bit later. Okay, Toadies? A little bit later. Okay. Toadies uh, started... The first place that, that we had them in Dallas was at Trees. Okay. Back in 90 and 91. And they were always the opening act. They would be opening for the Buck Pets or opening for Melt, who ended up becoming Funland. Mm -hmm. uh, they're totally starting out as an opening act, but quickly, quickly blew everybody away to the point that they ascended to becoming a headline act within a year. Wow. But they were at that time still very much a Fort Worth band. Mm -hmm. If you were to ask them, are you a Deep Island band? They would have said, no, we live in Fort Worth. Oh, That's sure. our thing. You know? Sure. Uh, that's an interesting thing because I know now there's still it's still hard for bands to break like from Dallas to Fort Worth, Fort Worth to Denton. Uh, was it like that back then? Was it really like segregated? Um, well, the it's weird. The center of gravity for music in Dallas has jumped all over town. Huh. When I was a first, when I was in high school, it was on Northwest Highway. There were clubs on Northwest Highway like the Agora and Cardi's, and it was all copy bands. Mm -hmm. When Deep Ellum happened. Uh, or between between that and Deep Ellen, there was Lower Greenville Avenue. Lower mm -hmm. Greenville had the Arcadia Theater and Tango and Port David's Pub and On the Air, which was the first music video place. Um, and then from there, it went to Deep Ellen. So it's jumped all over town. You know, for a while, it was in Oak Cliff with the Bronco Bowl or whatever. But um, rather than there be a delineation between, say, Dallas and Denton and Fort Worth, it was more about the different parts of Dallas. Huh. And a lot of Denton bands played in Deep Ellen. Uh, quite a few bands from Fort Worth played in Dallas and played in Deep Ellen Toadies and League of None and bands like that. Um, but the Denton bands, there was a whole subculture of Denton bands that were, had a very college age, uh, crowd. It was all North Texas State kids, like bands like Baboon and Caulk and all those bands that, that came up, Brutal Juice, mm -hmm. that all came up during that time. It was a very insulated scene. But the, the most popular bands out of those groups in Denton would come to Deep Ellum and usually find their larger audience here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, especially, you know, Ten Hands, they would draw five, six hundred people every time they play. They were totally a Den band. You know, is Mike uh, from? Is he from Den? I mean, or he's from New Orleans, right? Which Mike? Uh, Mike Jerome? No, from from Ten Hands. Uh, Mike. Oh, uh, Mike Dillon. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he lived in Den for a while. He's lived all over the place. Okay. Uh, the last time he played here, he was playing with Ricky Lee Jones. Oh, okay. And he lives in New Orleans, I think, most of the time. But he lived in Kansas City for a while. Uh, his his big Denton band, other than Ten Hands, was uh, Billy Goat. Yeah. I've I've had the privilege to shoot him in, like, seven bands at the yeah. Belmar Company. <laughs> like, every time he comes, it's a different configuration of people and music. And same with Kenny and New Bohemians. Like, yeah. there's been a lot of different versions of both that. Both of those guys, Mike Dillon and Kenny Withrow, both are two of the most versatile musicians. They yeah. played with so many different artists. Kenny's actually taught guitar lessons here at the Kessler. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, I've, I've talked to him. He's, he's got, I mean, I was, I'm a big deadhead, so I got to know him through the Forgotten Space when he was doing that. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, I mean. Kenny's brilliant, man. He's yeah. a brilliant musician, and he's just a great person. And same thing with Mike. Dylan is a, is a, is a yeah. brilliant musician as yeah, well. He's of one them. of the most gifted percussionists, you know. Percussion, being a drummer and being a percussionist is kind of weird because you're typically loud because what you do is typically loud but michael actually mike dylan actually plays percussion with such nuance mm -hmm. you know it, he can get super super quiet with it you know and get your undivided attention same thing with earl harvin mm -hmm. you know they're, they're they both approach it from a difference of rather than being bombastic and over the top like say the drummer and tool you know or somebody like that right. they're more of a nuanced musician who uses the drum kit or percussion setup as a melodic uh, instrument oh yeah i mean mike I, like i had i've seen him like with 10 different setups as well as 10 different groups of people so yeah, it's been yeah. cool let you know let me take a second let's can you talk about the past and the future of longhorn ballroom yeah sure uh the longhorn has an amazing history it's one of the um 
more tenured venues in town. It's actually been around for almost 50 years. Uh, there, It's gone through these different periods. It predominantly started out as a country and western place. Uh, it was called Bob Will's Roadhouse. And uh, a lot of the touring acts, the, the popular old school traditional country artists played here all the time, like George Jones, people like that. But it also had another uh, component that was the soul thing. Now, Monday nights, they would have what was called a uh, service industry night, which was mainly an African-American audience. And they had artists like James Brown and Al Green and Otis Redding and wow. people like that. I mean, it was incredible. That's an interesting. Oh, yeah. Wow. But it was an interesting juxtaposition, but it was entirely necessary. And then um, during the late 70s, it uh, became almost a punk rock place, you know, because the Sex Pistols played there and the Ramones and Patti Smith and, and all that. And when I went to work there in 1986, the guy who had just bought it, um, you know, he was like, I want to get back to this having a really broad palette. You know, I don't want people to think this is just a country place or whatever. Right. So most of the stuff that I, I brought in was like the Chili Peppers, Butthole Surfers, uh, Flaming Lips, Motorhead, Megadeth, stuff like that. Wow. And I was still a young person, but that room was super sturdy, you know, for that kind of audience. This is more of a rambunctious audience or mm -hmm. whatever. It was, it was, you know, perfect for that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, and it's gone through all these years where it had down years where there wasn't really a whole lot going on there, and the building kind of fell into disrepair. Uh, the music scene, like I said, has jumped all over town over the years, the different parts of town, and that that place was kind of isolated comparatively to the other stuff that's going on. So um, over the years, it kind of just fell out of grace. You know, there weren't a whole lot of people going there or seeing, putting on shows there or anything like that. And then Edwin Cabanis, who owns the Kessler here and owns the Heights in Houston or whatever, he'd always been kind of intrigued by the, the property and, and the history of the building or whatever. And he had this thing in the back of his mind that he really wanted to resurrect this venue the same way that he resurrected these two venues. Both of these, this was an old movie theater that Gene Autry owned, and the Heights was an old movie theater from that same era, from late 40s, early 50s. And mm -hmm. And as it turns out, Edwin has a real gift for finding these properties and breathing life into them once again. And also respecting the culture and the history of the venues themselves, which is important. I mean, it's a lot different than just going to a corporate venue and sitting in a brick enclosure and just yeah. listening to a band play to, a, you know, uh, an audience that's kind of indifferent and can't really wait to get home. Mm -hmm. This is more of an immersive experience where you're actually experiencing history in real time. And it's the same thing with the Longhorn. The Longhorn has this vast, vast history of all these different genres and different artists that have played there, whatever, which it would be a complete shame to let that go away, Absolutely. to let that building get torn down and let that property get used to something else. Edwin recognized that and how important it is to save that culture. And um, hopefully we, the team here at the Kessler, uh, Diana Cox and Allison Weaver and all the other people that work here, Jacob Madcalf, all the other folks that are, uh, you know, kind of helping to, to get the Longhorn back on track. Edwin obviously is the main driver behind it. He's the guy who, who you know, has the vision and the wherewithal to, you know, see this kind of rugged space and recognize what it could be if we all put our effort together and, and put the elbow grease into it to, you know, get it going again. And so that's, you know, uh, th this building that you're sitting in right now, the Kessler, when he first got it, I came up here and looked at it. And it was it was devastated. No one had been in it for 17 years. Hmm. And I knew that to make this place happen, it was going to take an unusually large commitment to uh, completely redo the interior. And it took 17 months to do that. Wow. And Longhorn's a bigger property yeah. with a much more ambitious uh, footprint, you know, that he wants to do. But the end result, I guarantee you, is going to be you're going to get that same uh, feeling you get when you come into the castle, that you're kind of stepping into a historical place that means something much larger than just the artist that happens to be on stage that night. Yeah, I can't wait till that. When is the expectations of that reopening? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, there, it's a much, much bigger endeavor. Right. But I think with a little luck, uh, late spring, early summer, we oh. should we should be. Oh, this... I mean, it, he's been working on it for a year now. Yeah, no, I knew, I know. I mean, I did get to see a show there a few years ago. It was like one, like I, which I was like, oh, I don't even know the place is open. And then it, that was it for a while. But I'm glad yeah. to hear that it's coming back. Okay, so the Longhorn Ballroom is what you got coming up. You're doing stuff at the Kessler. Is there anything else on the horizon for you? 
Mm, no, I mean, I just turned 60. So yeah. I'm actually kind of in a good place. I'm not really overly ambitious about doing anything other than what we have on our plate here. Sure. And I only have a certain amount of bandwidth. And yeah, as you get older, you know, you, you don't have as much energy. And mm -hmm. candidly, I mean, you know, one of the great things about working at the Kessler, our shows are always over at 1030 mm -hmm. or 11 oh, at the latest. Amazing. Yeah. And if you work in a bar, you know, if you work in a venue, and you've been doing it, like say trees would be open until two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So you know, you get three, home and four. you're trying to wind down. You don't get to sleep till five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So this place kind of being more geared earlier and it's, it's geared earlier on purpose because we sit in the middle of a residential district here. Right. And we didn't want this place to affect the neighborhood negatively with people, you know, in your front yard at two o'clock in the morning, taking a piss sure. or anything like that. Sure. So our stuff ends early and our customers are a little bit older demographic. They get home at a reasonable hour. That's one of the things that they, why they keep coming back. You know, as our show started at eight, they're always starting right on the money at eight o'clock. They're done by 1030. And if you're in a band, you know, you got to lug gear and all that stuff. You're home at midnight. Yeah. You yeah, know, that's... which is, uh, it, it helps, you know, a lot of the artists will tell you that's everything, you know? Yeah. And for someone my age, being 60 years old, it's perfect for me. I really wouldn't have the stamina to work at a venue until two o'clock in the morning yeah, every I, night. I'm the same like festivals. I'm like, nope, miss that. that I don't do festivals anymore <laughs> either. I'm, I'm glad they happened. Yeah. yeah. Good. But good it's, it's weird from a booking standpoint, you have to plan your year around it. Yeah. Because when those artists play those festivals, yeah, they yeah. have to do a radius deal where they can't play anywhere else during mm -hmm. the same time. So you have to kind of gather them in and get them in here during the time that they're not locked down to the festival that they're playing at. Right. No, absolutely. For a long um, time, South by Southwest was that way. We had all these artists that wanted to route through here on the way to South by Southwest, but South by Southwest wouldn't let them do it. Yeah, it's so frustrating. Wouldn't let them play anywhere else in Texas, you know? Yeah. Well, because like, what you're going to play here, and that's going to kill your audience at South by. That's making and no South sense. By Southwest, they're all playing in front of an audience that bought badges anyway. Right. You know, they're yeah. not like they're yet for selling tickets to the show down there. Yeah. You know. And speaking of that, I'm done with South by Southwest too. <laughs> it's such a Z hey, down there. Deckin and Dove team played at the first couple of them. Yep. It was a lot different then. I bet. And I'll tell you how South by Southwest came to be. Very briefly, during the '80s, there used to be this thing in New York called the New Music Seminar. Yeah. And the new music seminar was a blast. We went every summer. It was tons of bands, tons of music industry people. You know, it was a great place to be. I mean, there's just, you get to see all these bands or whatever. So the guys who run South by Southwest, they were all club owners, the booking agents in Austin. You know, they all had their places, but they're like me. They got to be a certain age where they didn't really have the stamina to keep doing it every night. Mm -hmm. So they saw what was happening in New York at the new music seminar. And they said, what if we did this in Austin? So the first couple of South by Southwest were a whole lot like the New Music Seminar. You know, they were very, very similar. And sooner or later, the New Music Seminar went out of business. Hmm. And people started coming to Austin and seeing the environment and the culture and all the stuff that was going on here. And of course, Austin had a great music heritage. Mm -hmm. You know, they said, this is actually a better place to do this kind of festival thing every year. And every year, South by Southwest kept getting bigger and bigger. And then it had a film component. And then it had a, a digital tech component and all that. And it just became this whole other thing. Yeah. You know, and the music business itself at the same time was kind of scaling down. Once Napster happened and record stores started to go away and, and the whole model of retail sales for records and record labels and all that stuff, all that started to scale way, way down. Yeah. So South by Southwest then became a film thing, you know, yeah. and it became, you know, digital tech and web stuff and all that. They had to diversify in all these different areas. New music seminar in New York was just music. Right. That's all it was. It was mainly DJs and bands and managers and publishers and all these people that made up the music business while it still existed. Right. You know, and as South by Southwest got bigger, the music industry was getting smaller. That's you know, they, they still that, had the but... live music scene happening in Austin, something mm -hmm. they could be proud of and say we're the live music capital of the world or whatever. But the reality is the music business itself wasn't prepared for the transition between retail brick and mortar sales to selling stuff online. They right. didn't have a model built yet to sell music online. So that took, you know, most of the people in the music business at that time were older and they weren't tech savvy. Right. They weren't ready to plug a new way in to do this. And as a result, when Napster happened, everybody started getting music for free. You know, all yeah. the revenue streams in the music business just collapsed. 
I mean, I mean, really, the only thing left is publishing. You know, yeah. most of the time, bands on tour playing live is a break-even proposition at best. And so, publishing the people who are the songwriters, they're really the only people who still have to get paid. Yeah. You know, look, I mean, you can you can sell music on on Spotify or whatever, and you don't get paid shit for it. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's it's. I mean, the rec the record the way record deals were sk- were situated back in the day, the band basically got ten percent of the money. Right. If your record sold for ten bucks, you got a dollar. <laughs> So musicians have always been used to getting ripped off, but now once Napster came along and digital formatting came along, they got totally ripped off. Yeah. It went from you getting nothing, I mean, uh, getting a little bit to getting nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's when I was, that's when I was trying to get signed right when that happened. Yeah. (laughs) And I, 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 for the long, for the life of me, I still can't understand how record labels still exist. Yeah, I don't. I you don't know, know how how do they make money? Well, Streaming, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, some like they're like, you're the band, make the album, bring it to us, we'll promote it. Like yeah. that's all they're doing is spending it on. In that. a way, that's good for the bands because they have more creative control. Yeah. But the other thing, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, is if you, say, come up with this amazing piece of music, song like Back Loser, you know, you yeah. come up with something that just captivates everybody and they don't like it, then everybody expects you to keep doing that same thing over and over again. Right. And an artist like Beck can reinvent himself every record, but not every artist can do that. No, no. And if you've got a record label breathing down your neck saying, hey, we need another one of these, we need another one of those, you know, then you're, they're not, you're not even the band anymore. You're just a mechanic who's yeah. like creating something that, you know, <laughs> right. they that's, can use to plug into their template. You know? Yeah, fulfilling an obligation and that's yeah, about it. Yeah. Hey, Jeffrey, this has been better than I expected. Really, thank you for, for <laughs> well, because I mean, honestly, you're my first, I'm new at this, you're my first guest that I didn't know. Uh-huh. And I also, you know, it's a balance between like getting to know the person and, and like, I really wanted to hear a lot of these stories about Dallas music. So I feel like we did all of that. So that was great. Well, I, you know, I've been really, really lucky in the respect. I mean, I've watched a lot of artists. Uh, I've seen them kind of the trajectory of their careers happen. And like, say, the Red Hot Chili Peppers are an example. You know, when we first met them, when they first played her, they were regular guys. They were a lot of fun. I could take them out to my mom's house to wash their clothes and that kind of stuff. Right. Now they're playing in stadiums. Yeah. And when you get to be that big, you lose the personal connection with your audience. You lose your identity. I mean, you become public domain. Yeah. You know, and the one thing that I've been really fortunate in uh is I've been able to make music and create music and put records out or whatever, and I'm still relatively anonymous. I can still go eat in a restaurant and nobody knows who I am. Right. And that's so precious. I mean, you, you find out that yeah. anonymity really is the most precious thing you can ever keep. Because once you become a public profile person, uh, strangers have the, the right to just come up to you and start talking to you like they own you. Yeah. You know, like the, like you owe them a discussion, a conversation or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I've had enough success where I got to do all the Palooza and do all these other things or whatever. But still, here it is 20 years later. I can still walk down the street and nobody knows who I am. Right. And that means everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, think, I think about that. I think about how, how happy I am I didn't get famous in LA. <laughs> I think yeah. about it all the time. Cause I'm you like, get famous. There comes a time where you're not famous anymore. Do you know, do you know who the comedian Bo Burnham is? Mm-mm. Bo Burnham is a brilliant comedian who was incredibly popular in the mid two thousands, you know, or whatever. He freaked out. He got to be so popular. He started losing it. He started having panic attacks on stage wow. and just quit performing. Yeah. You know, he's a brilliant dude who still does these kind of things at home and stuff, makes these videos at home. But he won't set on stage, set foot on stage anymore. Oh, that's sad. You know, he just can't do it. Yeah. And it's because when he became a profile person, it took away his identity, whether mm-hmm. he had a public identity where these people embraced him and loved him and worshipped everything he did or whatever. But that made him uncomfortable. Mm. It, and, and within his own head, he lost who he was. Yeah. You know, and that happens to a lot of people. Oh, yeah. You know, it really does. You're wondering, you know, did I ever really deserve to make it? Did I mean, I really ever deserve this kind of attention? You know, there there are some people that really want to be the center of attention. Whenever they can possibly do that, that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. But there's an enormous amount of responsibility with that. And there's an enormous amount of um, privacy and anonymity that you sacrifice. And believe me, it's weird when strangers come up to you and start talking to you saying, oh, you did this and you did that or whatever. And you're just kind of like, yeah, I did. You know? <laughs> right, right. Okay, Jeff, thanks again. Sure. I'd like to thank my guest, Jeffrey Lyles. Theme song, Unstoppable by Celine Narala. You can check out the Dallas Famous podcast on DeepLMRadio.com every Sunday and Tuesday at 1 p.m. 
Follow us on Instagram and Facebook, and we hope you check in next week. Thanks again.